100 years ago, the airplane was a novelty, a source of thrills in the hands of barnstormers and daredevils. Air shows started around the world, and they were attended by 100,000 people, 200,000 people, and there are press reports of jaw-dropped crowds watching specks appear in the distance and then grow into airplanes. They were diving and then taking off. People simply couldn't believe this was true. What you really did hear people saying was, my gosh, if we can do that, what can't we do? Bill Boeing was 28 years old when he first saw an airplane fly. Bill Boeing went to the LA Air Show in January of 1910. Boeing, like many other people in the field, the second they were exposed to aviation, it became a passion. He had other interests and he was making money from other things, but he effectively became an aviation businessman from that very first moment. Bill Boeing came to maturity at that time when all that was going on. And even though there were all these problems about these lumbering, relatively unsafe, noisy airplanes, the, he was caught by the magic. I think he was really touched by the magic. He was drawn to the spectacle of flight, but from the start, he believed that the airplane was more than entertainment. He has a vision for what it can become for the future of this product that's uh, kind of frail and fragile in his era. He envisioned that this assemblage of wood, wire, and cloth, invented by two bicycle mechanics, Orville and Wilbur Wright, would one day be as central to daily life as the railroad and the automobile. Boeing was already wealthy from managing and expanding his timber trading business in the Pacific Northwest. But Boeing's legacy is the company he founded in 1916. He literally made his first trip out to the West Coast the year of the Wright brothers' first flight. He went out as a natural resource commodity trader, yet envisioned this broad new industry that has driven every corner of our society for the next 100 years. Everybody now takes aviation to granted. All that stuff had to be invented, every single bit of it. The Wright brothers' first flying machine inspired imitators and innovators alike. Boeing was bent on innovation. After his very first flight, he was looking for ways to advance the technology of aviation. When he got off the plane, he was very impressed, but he was also convinced that they could make it even better. Boeing had the intellect and the means to do just that. It was a time, much as today, a young man can come up with an app and, and make some money. In those days, a man with a good idea could maneuver himself into a place where he was in the top of the industry in relatively short order. There were literally dozens of shops in the United States and Europe, like Boeing's company. They were taking the Wright Brothers flying machine as a starting point and running with it. The Wright Brothers were just dealing with the very rudiments of the technology. And then there's the second wave of innovation where you're trying to find applications for it, as in computers, where you get people like a Steve Jobs who actually begin to think in terms of building something that people will use. So when the Boeings of the world came into aviation, he is thinking, what can we use this for? The company settled on the grounds of a shipyard in a building that would one day be called the Red Barn. They started with a small crew of woodworkers and seamstresses. Their first planes were built on this muddy little river at the back of some industrial area in Seattle, and they were at first feeling their way. 
and it was canvas and glue and wood. William Boeing had a real eye for both engineering talent and managerial talent. Engineers on whose back the future of the company would literally rest. In 1916, the company hired its first aeronautical engineer. Wang Su was Chinese, MIT graduate. Bill Boeing hired him. And he, by the way, went back to China after a period of time and helped them found their aerospace industry. From the start, Boeing was intent on building a viable business. The key was answering the question, what is an airplane for? The early answer to that question was war. Adversaries grasped at any technology that provided an advantage. Even before the First World War began in 1914, European and eventually American armed forces saw the potential of these flying machines. When the airplane was introduced, suddenly you had a third dimension. World War I was bogged down in trench warfare. People digging into the ground, stuck in the ground, fighting over tens of feet. And along comes the airplane, and I'm no longer stuck in the ground. I can go over all of it. The obvious value was the ability to scout, to get into the air, fly toward the enemy, and get a view of what was happening out there. The airplane would go out and do what the cavalry scouts used to do. Boeing's first customer was the United States military. Wong Su was the aeronautical engineer on the Model C. The Navy ordered 50 as trainers. Employees numbered over 300 as the production ramped up to build the Navy plane. But the sudden end of the war in 1918 exposed the boom and bust nature of the aviation business. Military orders dried up. Two thirds of the employees were let go and the Boeing Airplane Company for a time was making furniture. Bill Boeing needed another answer to the question, what was an airplane for? The lifeblood of the American economy after World War I was money and mail. Moving both was what made it work. Mail contracts created what we know now as the domestic airline business. It's almost as though the United States physically was designed for airmail because of the vastness of the United States. There was a market there for transporting mail. There was no interstate highway network at that time. In fact, planes came before roads. Even by rail, a letter could take a week to reach the opposite coast. The relatively primitive aircraft of the day promised to accelerate mail and commerce, but at great risk. Planes were very unreliable, where weather conditions posed extremely severe challenges on aircraft operations. When the airplanes themselves lacked the kind of instrumentation that just a decade later would be routine. As a result, you had very high casualty rates. As dangerous as it was, flying the mail was going to be a business. Boeing himself tested the concept in 1919 when he flew between Seattle and Vancouver, Canada, establishing the first international airmail route. In the 1920s, the sole driver almost of aviation after the First World War were mail contracts. Aircraft manufacturers lived and died on mail contracts. That's what kept Boeing and others in business. The Model 40A was a plane Boeing built to deliver the mail. In many ways, it was the first non-military aircraft that would embody Bill Boeing's vision of competing in the aviation business by offering planes with the most advanced design and engineering possible. It used welded steel tubing in the frame and had an air-cooled engine that made it 200 pounds lighter than the competition. With the 40A, 
Boeing bid on and won a government contract to carry the mail between San Francisco and Chicago, putting the Boeing company in the air transport business. Soon, other routes were acquired. Boeing was on a path to dominate the airmail business. Getting those mail contracts was key because it was creating a network which would later become the domestic airline network. So the value of those mail contracts was enormous. And airmail would soon give way to an even more profitable cargo, paying passengers. In 1927, American aviation found its heroic voice. Charles Lindbergh, barnstormer and early airmail pilot, made the first solo flight across the Atlantic in his spirit of St. Louis. He did enormous amount for aviation to push it forward uh, in people's minds as a way of travel. Charles Lindbergh was in many ways the first modern celebrity. The impact of his flight on people around the world is difficult in a sense for us to understand today. It was absolutely a revolution. Millions and millions of Americans saw him or listened to him. He visited 83 cities across the United States. He was a rock star, an idol for millions of Americans and people around the world. It seems to me that it's up to us to create and develop passenger lines to compare with our mail routes. What we need now to develop our aviation is a series of airports at every town and city in the country. Passenger travel by air had been more of a concept than a reality up till then. Tucked in the forward cabin of the Model 40A was room for two if the plane did not need the space for mail. The first passenger flights were tucking somebody to sit on mail bags, you know, flying from Pittsburgh to Chicago, as an example, in an open cockpit. And uh, it had to be pretty rugged to withstand one of those journeys. But in the post Lindbergh era, some affluent people began to consider air travel seriously. Boeing introduced the Model 80. It was the first Boeing aircraft designed with passengers in mind. It could accommodate 12 travelers in leather upholstered seats in the comfort of a heated cabin with hot and cold running water. The Model 80 introduced the concept of flight attendants registered nurses who were now there to serve and reassure the apprehensive traveler. People who could afford the expense of flying now wanted to travel by air. And America was increasingly dependent on the rapid delivery of mail. The aviation business was about to boom. But the country at large was falling into years of depression. The stock market crashed. Millions were out of work, but airplanes were in demand and airlines were expanding. Bill Boeing and the men and women who built the company with him saw a grand opportunity. If you not only build airplanes, you can acquire a company that, say, builds airplane engines and another company that, say, operates the airplanes, operates airmail routes. Then you've really got the makings of something. Boeing's idea was to combine these separate companies into a much larger company. In a way, what he was imagining very early on was the modern corporation. Bill Boeing thought that it wasn't any good making planes if you didn't have an airline to fly them. And why not own the airline as well as the plane? Boeing first merged with engine maker Pratt & Whitney. The new company, called United Aircraft and Transport Corporation, then began buying a string of smaller aircraft companies. In only a few short years, United Aircraft and Transport became a hugely successful aviation holding company, thriving even as the economy as a whole suffered. It bought other carriers and knit their routes together into a national service that soon was handling 50% of all airmail and passenger traffic in the United States. It became United Airlines. In the 1920s, it seemed quite natural to aircraft developers at the time to partner 
with other suppliers and manufacturers to create a unified whole, a, a one-stop shopping, so to speak, center for aeronautics. In the year of the Wall Street crash, 1929, Bill Boeing's holding company, United Aircraft and Transport, showed a profit of more than $8 million, the equivalent of over $100 million today. Boeing really made it work. He really made the whole functional structure of the airframe manufacturer, the engine manufacturer, and the airline work together very, very well. Boeing was succeeding at the two things he valued most, advancing aviation technology and operating a successful business. But an emerging rival would soon challenge Boeing's dominance. Let no innovation in aviation pass us by. That was Bill Boeing's charge to his company. The company was rolling out some of the most advanced aircraft ever built. In 1930, under the banner of United Aircraft, they debuted an all-metal, single-wing plane they called the Monomail. It had retractable landing gear, a streamlined aerodynamic fuselage, and was twice as fast as the biplanes of the previous era. Almost immediately, Boeing began work on another single-wing plane that would be even more revolutionary in its design. The Boeing 247 was in many ways the first truly modern commercial airliner. It was the centerpiece of the 1933 World's Fair in Chicago, called the Century of Progress. The Boeing 247 had at variable pitch propellers, heated cabins, uh, retractable undercarriage, de-icing on the wings and the tail, and autopilot. Every new technology that was evolved through the late 1920s into the 1930s, a giant leap forward. And they had an order for 60 from United Airlines, which incidentally they owned. So Boeing's United Aircraft the builder of the plane was selling the 247 to another division of its holding company, United Airlines. It's kind of weird now to think that an airplane manufacturer should also own the airline, but it it's not, wasn't weird then. It was a, a pioneering business, and why not own the market for the product that you were building? Other airlines had to stand in line and wait until United Airlines got its 60 planes. That was how Bill Boeing wanted his holding company to work. So in one sense, this was a great thing. However, the other airlines, Transworld Airways, the major rival, turned to other manufacturers and said, can you build an aeroplane to beat this? TWA was just emerging as a transcontinental airline. They wanted to get in on this new generation of airliners. Having been turned away by Boeing, they went to Douglas and said, can you give us a plane? TWA, American Airlines, and KLM all turned to the one company that rivaled Boeing, the Douglas Aircraft Company, and its founder, Donald Douglas. Donald Douglas was probably one of the great geniuses of the 20th century. Not only that, he was charming, uh, very good looking, a pin-up boy, if you like, and a brilliant engineer who drew people to him. He was able to assemble around him some of the greatest engineers in aviation who went to Southern California for the sunshine and the chance at working for one of the great aviation companies of the world. The Boeing-Douglas rivalry is probably the greatest of all American aeronautical rivalries. Boeing lagged behind Douglas in commercial aeronautics because although it was innovative, it wasn't quite innovative enough. Douglas was the so-called fast second the risk of being first is that the competition can treat your model as a prototype, learn from it, and then turn around and make a plane that's even better. Douglas did just that with his DC-1. Douglas was able to seize upon what made the 247 a very good design, but go well beyond it. It used different materials that were stronger, more rugged materials. It used more refined aircraft design. There was a, a greater amount of wind tunnel testing and analytical work that went into that design. In many ways, the Douglas DC-1, I would argue, was the first truly scientifically designed American airplane. It was really phenomenal. 
and then Douglas absolutely blitzed Boeing with the DC-2 and the DC-3. I mean, they just simply wiped them out. Just totally dominated aviation. Airlines bought hundreds of DC-3s. The military would buy thousands. The 247 was history. No one knows those numbers, 247. It's a, it's a plane that virtually disappeared. But Bill Boeing was a businessman. He could accept the failure of the 247. He had constructed United Aircraft and Transport to survive the inevitable downturns of the aviation business. Boeing's commercial aircraft were not selling, but there was the airline, United. It was transporting more passengers every year. The engine maker, Pratt & Whitney, was making money, and there were the contracts to deliver the mail. Delivering the mail remained a gold mine for the aviation business. But in 1934, it was those very contracts with the post office that would upend the business Bill Boeing had so carefully constructed. In the Depression, success was suspect. To see some companies surviving, actually prospering, when others are suffering, makes these companies or these industries an obvious target. And companies that profited from contracts with the U.S. government were the easiest targets. United Aircraft and Transport Corporation, in particular, because it was so well run and because it controlled 50% of the market, people assumed that that money was gotten through corruption. Taking aim was an ambitious senator named Hugo Black, who accused Boeing and others of having colluded with the post office to win the airmail contracts. Senator Black insinuated that these companies were getting rich off the taxpayer. He wanted the contracts voided and companies like Boeing's United Aircraft and Transport broken up. We cannot build up an aviation industry upon a rotten foundation. It is my judgment that this change will result in a thorough cleaning out of the aviation industry. It will be taken out of the hands of stock jobbers and promoters. Black and other members of the U.S. Congress call the executives of the major aircraft and airline companies to Washington for hearings. Those hearings are intense. They are hostile. Bill Boeing was among those called to testify. He was grilled for nearly six hours and accused of having profited unfairly from the airmail contracts. The contract awards have been driven by safety and efficiency, by the need to give the awards to companies that could actually furnish the kind of reliable service that the airmail needed, and also companies that could carry the airmail safely without accidents. That was missed completely. Practically a lone voice against the rush to judgment was America's aviation hero, Charles Lindbergh. The most fundamental question in this situation, and that is whether or not these airlines have a right to trial before they are convicted. It was a bit of a kangaroo court. Bill Boeing never got over that. There was an atmosphere of, let's go for the robber barons, and I think that was unfair. They were pioneering a new technology, and flying the mail was a very dangerous and risky business, and they had basically created that system. I think Bill Boeing was right in feeling that they were unfairly singled out. But the punishment handed out by Congress was swift and dramatic. They decided that the merger that had taken place of these aircraft companies with their airlines that were moving passengers and freight all across the country, that this concentrated too much power in the hands of a few companies. And so they commanded that those companies be broken up. It was a, almost as if uh, the federal government had stepped in and demanded that America's top computer companies be broken up and that those who design computers can no longer sell them. So the rule becomes you can't be a manufacturer who runs an airline at the same time. It caused the breakup of Bill Boeing's carefully constructed holding company and others like it. Essentially, the American aircraft manufacturers, and particularly the American airline haulers, were being punished for success. They were being punished for having done their job very, very well. It was a tremendous injustice. President Franklin Roosevelt went even further. He ordered the Postmaster General to cancel all the airmail contracts. 
President Roosevelt voids the existing contracts and says, I'm withdrawing all of the airmail contracts to the U.S. airlines. I'm going to have the U.S. Army carry the mail. While 83 companies fight the sudden loss of airmail contracts, the Army gets ready to take over the job again. The plan was a disaster from the start. The United States Army Air Corps had neither the aircraft, nor the training, nor the experience. And very quickly, you had 12 fatalities, and you had over 60 accidents as the Army tried to carry the mail. It nearly shattered as well the established air transport system that had been set up across the United States. It was no consolation that within a few months, Roosevelt saw the folly of his decision and reversed it. By then, Bill Boeing's company was being broken up. Building modern airplanes was easier than building a modern corporation. Bill Boeing said to himself, to hell with it. I'm getting out, I'm leaving the business, don't ever call me again. It was a stunning climax to an extraordinary career. He sold all his stock and left the aviation business forever. The industry that had started in the Wright Brothers bicycle shop was just over 30 years old. But everything about airplanes and aircraft manufacturing had been transformed. Boeing's contribution was the industrialization of the invention. The Wright Brothers never saw the industrialization of their invention in the way that Henry Ford did with the car or Bill Boeing did with the plane. That was Bill Boeing's great vision. When asked by an interviewer to comment on his company's success, Bill Boeing said, I've tried to make the men around me feel as I do, that we are embarked as pioneers upon a new science and industry, in which our problems are so new and unusual that it behooves no one to dismiss any novel idea with the cocksure statement, it can't be done. It was a message these men and women would have to embrace if the company was to survive without Bill Boeing. In the 1930s, the press was proclaiming that America was entering the golden age of flight, and it was largely because of Donald Douglas and the Douglas Aircraft Company. Its Douglas commercial series were the first planes to make money simply by carrying passengers, not mail. Travel on its planes achieved a level of safety, comfort, and sophistication that was changing how people viewed travel by air. For the passenger, it meant that instead of being an endurance, it became pleasurable. This was a new era of travel. And set in the Depression, this was uh, the space age, if you like, of the 1930s. There was a time everybody flocked to the airports on Sunday afternoons to watch the planes take off. And I'm not talking about passengers or family of passengers, I'm just talking about ordinary people. Most of those people would never set foot on an airplane. Air travel was the province of the affluent. A fantasy on a par with Hollywood movies that glamorized stars even as the depression deepened. There would be photographers stationed there when a flight would be coming in, say, from the West Coast, because they knew that there would probably be a recognizable celebrity. People dressed up to fly. Women would wear pearls and their best suits, and men would wear ties. Airlines were quick to realize that to capture those passengers, they had to outdo each other. Luxurious fittings were the order of the day. The plane that came to symbolize this era of luxurious travel as much as any other was the Clipper, a name that evoked images of sailing as much as soaring, since the Clipper was both a plane and a boat. Others made them, but none were as large and opulent as the ones that Boeing built for Pan Am in Seattle. The Pan Am Clippers symbolized the first golden age of air travel. They were somewhat ungainly to look at, but they were beautiful. 
silver hulled majestic. They all had names like China Clipper, names that conjured exotic places. The Clipper was built to meet the ever expanding ambitions of the only truly global airline of the era, Pan American World Airways. Almost anywhere a ship could dock, a Clipper could land. The big Clippers, perhaps the most romantic commercial airplanes ever built and flown, getting on these big flying boats and traveling across the Pacific to Hawaii, to Manila, and ultimately on to Hong Kong. Pan Am blazed new aeronautical routes. But the reality was that as iconic as the Clippers were, Boeing only built 12 of them. The Boeing company in the 1930s was a company in trouble. It had a history of making innovative aircraft, but its rival, Douglas Aircraft, dominated the market for passenger planes in the Golden Age. In 1934, Boeing was forced to slash its workforce from 1,700 to 700. But in August of that year, Boeing received a formal circular from the U.S. Army that would save the company. It was a request that Boeing enter a competition against Douglas and Martin to build a new bomber for the American military. It called for a multi-engine bomber capable of carrying a ton of explosives and travel up to 2,200 miles at a speed of more than 200 miles an hour. The winner would receive an order for more than 200 planes. They had to put all of their own capital, all their own money into the prototype. It was really almost a last throw of the dice for Boeing. In 1934, Boeing tied its future to building a bomber beyond all other bombers. It was a concept that had captivated Boeing's new president, Claire Ekvet, since 1923, when he had witnessed an early demonstration of air power staged by one of military aviation's early advocates, Brigadier General Billy Mitchell. Ekvet had been present when Billy Mitchell bombed two American battleships. This is one of his demonstrations of air power. the primitive bombers attacked and sank both the decommissioned ships. We're talking about an era in which planes are still basically sort of big kites made with struts and wires and stretched canvas. And Mitchell is able to sink these mammoth ships from aerial bombing alone. Egbert was absolutely mesmerized by this demonstration of what airplanes could do. But the Navy was not impressed. The ships were aging, unarmed, sitting targets. Admirals who witnessed the demonstration dismissed it as a stunt. Egbert heard an admiral say, well, you know, it's very impressive, but these planes aren't dreadnoughts. That word sank into his brain. A dreadnought was a state-of-the-art warship bristling with guns and a steel hull so strong it was almost unsinkable. In the Admiral's mind, it would take nothing less than a dreadnought of the air to sink a battleship. And from that point on, the idea for Egbert of creating a dreadnought of the air obsessed him. And a decade had passed, and for Egbert, the Army's request to design and build a truly modern bomber made perfect sense. When the Army approached him with the idea of a long-range bomber that could, in fact, travel for thousands of miles and deliver bombs in a massive way on targets, Claire Egvet decided it was time to push ahead with something he'd been dreaming about since the 1920s. The Army Air Corps stipulated a multi-engine bomber Egvet envisioned a plane with four engines, and he knew the engineer to design it. Ed Wells is a very young man when he was brought in to design what was really a revolutionary plane. He's so young that even he sort of wondered what in the world he was doing there. Ed Wells is among the greatest engineering minds in the history of aviation. 
Bill Boeing had hired him after he graduated from Stanford University in 1931. But Boeing, he was nicknamed the college boy, which gives you an idea of what the background was for a lot of those guys. They didn't have college degrees. They were experienced men. They knew how to make airplanes. Wells was 24 years old. He was married on a Saturday and began work the following Tuesday. His salary was $125 a month. Ed Wells was very quiet, methodical, and systematic. He was a very reserved engineering figure, a guy who you locked in a room and came up with genius ideas. It was Ed Wells, Claire Egvet, and the tide of history that would bring the Boeing Company back from near extinction. In the 1930s, most Americans were unconcerned with the events taking place overseas. The fact that fascists were on the rise in Europe and Asia was not a reason to take up arms. Protected by two oceans, Americans were comfortable with their isolation. The American military was unprepared for war. The army was small and the Navy's ships were aging. Those who saw the future of air power, like Billy Mitchell, were seen as radicals. There were members of Congress who even feared that building a big bomber in peacetime would provoke the fascists to make war. The only reason the army was able to convince Congress to authorize money to build a bomber was as a coastal defense plane. The idea was that its long range would give it the possibility of protecting America's coastline in conjunction with the Navy, and this is the way in which it was basically sold. The B-17 prototype was designed and built in only 11 months. 11 months from drawings to a viable airplane, and it was a plane packed with innovations. The pilot sat in a heated flight deck. There were five gun positions, one mounted midway under the fuselage. Two on either side were called waste gun positions and were enclosed in a then new material, plexiglass. The entire structure was reinforced in ways never tried before. The B-17 was Ed Wells' creation in fundamental ways. Ed Wells was doing what Bill Boeing, the founder of Boeing, had intended the company should do, which was to build the most advanced machine they could do with the materials available. When Wells B-17 emerged from the factory, it was a plane of a different order of magnitude. A Seattle reporter called it a flying fortress, and the name stuck. In October 1935, Wells traveled to Dayton, Ohio, where the Army would test the competing airplanes against each other. Wells wrote his father, the very idea almost scares me stiff, but I'll do my best to justify the faith the company is putting in me. The fate of the company was resting on the outcome of the trials. But Egved and Wells were confident that only their plane had met and exceeded every specification that the Army had requested. The Douglas and Martin prototypes were two-engine planes. They were modeled after almost every other widely produced commercial aircraft of the day. But the B-17, with four engines, was bigger and faster. It could fly higher, farther, and carry five times as many bombs. The Army Air Corps really liked its performance. They liked what it could do. The next to the last day, before the competition was uh, to come to an end. Uh, the Army Air Corps wanted to fly the airplane one more time. It was a formality. The B-17 was clearly going to be the winner of the competition. The plane lifted off easily, climbed, but suddenly everything went wrong. The B-17 appeared to stall in midair then fell out of the sky. It crashed and burned. And Ed Wells, he said it was like watching a child die. Two pilots died in the fire. They bet the farm on the B-17, and they built a magnificent airplane. 
All the money Boeing had invested, half a million dollars, in 1935 is a huge amount of money. Literally went up in flames. Douglas won the competition. They were given an order for more than 100 two-engine bombers. But the investigation into the crash of the B-17 revealed there were no mechanical problems with the plane. The cause was a tragic mistake. The prototype had a simple device to lock the elevator section of the tail while the plane was parked, like a handbrake on an automobile. The Army test pilot took off without releasing the lock. Boeing had lost, but Ed Wells had designed a plane so superior to the competition that even those who wrote the rules wanted to break them. The Army Air Corps was so adamant that they wanted this airplane that they approached their superiors in the Army and begged, pleaded, and cajoled to buy a squadron's worth of B-17s. That one purchase kept Boeing going. The Army Air Corps ordered 13 B-17s, but Boeing was only barely surviving. The stark reality was that for nearly a decade, none of its planes made money. Even as its designs pushed the limits of technology, by 1939, the company had to borrow money every week to meet its payroll. But that's how close it came to the demise of a company that was not only the builder of the B-17, but would go on in World War II to build the greatest super bomber of them all, the B-29. It was World War II that changed everything. For the next five years, the world would be at war. America alone would build over 100,000 aircraft. Ed Wells and Claire Egbert's B-17 would literally change the course of history.